Hello. So now we're going to think about a second type of shoreline dominated by river mouth processes. And here we're thinking about deltas. So thinking back to our triangular classification with fluvial or river mouth processes, wave and tidal processes at the three corners. Here we're looking at the, the part of the triangle which is closest to the, the fluvial section. And you'll see here we have different types of deltas depending on the degree to which there's some influence of waves and tides. In terms of the map view, um, deltas are regressive, progradational features. They build out from the coastline. Um, and you can see examples in here. As we discussed thinking about when thinking about waves and storms, um, there's a continuum between wave dominated deltas and strand planes. So what are the key processes that occur at river mouths? Well, basically, you know, river is feeding sediments and water into the shoreline. That's what gives us a, or builds out a delta. And we can think about three different, uh, well, we, we can think about a number of different forces that are important. So one of them is the density of the, the water, um, including the sediment which comes in from the river and how that, density compares to the density in the lake or the ocean which is receiving that water. The other thing we can think about, you know, the, the, the slug of sediment and water which comes in through the river is buoyancy. That's related, that is in part related to the density and also friction, how that slug of, of water and sediments interacts with friction on, um, on the seabed or the lake bed. Inertia, that's the momentum which that, that water and sediment is carrying as it exits the river mouth. That can also be important, an important force. We can also think about the position of a delta within the basin. Uh, is, it, is the delta building out sort of on the inner part of the shelf, a long way from the shelf edge? Or is, it, is a delta built out to the, to the shelf edge itself? And there it might be, um, exposed to strong waves and tides uh, directly in the open ocean. And we can also think about the degree to which waves, storms, tides are important. And that is sort of captured in, in the classification of deltas as being river dominated, wave dominated or tide dominated. So let's start off with density. There are three different sort of scenarios we can envisage. The first one is that the, the water and sediment coming from the river mouth is the same density as the water in the receiving basin. So this diagram, this top diagram is showing a map view. Here's our river schematically feeding sediments and water into a, a basin, a lake or an ocean. And if the water from the river mouth is the same density as the water from in the basin, then we have very thorough mixing directly at the river mouth. This bottom diagram here is a cross section. So here is the cross section sort of running through the center of this map view at the top. Here we had the river and then um, the river water expanding into the deeper part of the basin. So if we have very thorough mixing of the water from the river and the water in the basin, that means that there's a, there's a rapid decrease in velocity, a rapid deceleration as the river water enters the basin. That rapid deceleration means that, we, we, uh, that the, the river water can no longer has enough velocity to carry sediment in suspension. It basically it deposits all that sediment as bed load um, just in front of the river mouth. So we have the development of a, of a, a bar, a mouth bar at, at the river mouth. And that mouth bar is characterized by having coarse grain, lots of sand, for example. And it, it's, it has a steep angle at its front. So th this, this type of delta is common, for example, where rivers feed into lakes. Uh, again, there's not much contrast in the density of the river and the lake water then. And we develop these very steep fronted sandy or gravelly deltas. And those are sometimes referred to as Gilbert type deltas. Gilbert was the first person to describe these deltas, looking at um, gravelly deltas in Pleistocene 
of Pleistocene age in the USA. So this condition of river water being having the same density as the basin water is referred to as homopicnal flow. And we generate these steep fronted sand rich deltas, sometimes referred to as Gilbert type deltas. OK, the second condition is, you know, if our river mouth water is carrying a lot of suspended sediment, a lot of sediment carry within it, then it, it can be denser than the water in a lake or an ocean. So again, we have a map view here and a cross section at the bottom. Maybe the cross section is easier to understand. Here we have our dense river water, again, carrying lots of sediment with it. It's denser than the water in the basin. So once, once that river water exits the river mouth, it basically forms a, a dense flow that flows along the seabed or the lake bed. And basically it carries that sediment to a position out in the basin. Once this flow starts to decelerate, loses velocity, we start to deposit that sediment. So what we're describing here is really a form of gravity flow. We have dense uh, water carrying sediment that flows under gravity down a slope until it decelerates and then deposits that sediment. So you can think about this as being similar to a, a turbidity current, a turbidite. We'll come back to those in a couple of days time, but if you've come across those before, you can, you can think about this as being a similar process. So river water, denser than basin water, we have this, this, this denser underflow, sometimes or you know, formally referred to as hyperpycnal flow. And this might be common, for example, uh, when a river is in flood, when it's carrying a lot of sediment, or for steep rivers that are draining mountain belts. And again, they're carrying lots of sediment within their water. The third condition, um, is what happens if the river water is less dense than the basin water. So for example, here this may be a river which is not in flood, it's not carrying much sediment. Again, we've got a map view at the top and a cross section at the bottom. The cross section again is probably more informative. So in this case, we have our uh, river water entering the basin. Um, Material that's, that's been transported as, as dunes, typically on the bed of the river, is deposited in a, a mouth bar, so a bar at the mouth of the river. But suspended sediment, mud, silt, that's, that's carried out in a, in a plume which is buoyant. It's less dense than the water in the basin. So that spreads out along the surface of the water. And as it spreads out, the velocity decreases and Again, as that velocity decreases, the finer sediment can settle down through the water column and reach the seabed. So this condition is referred to as hypopicnal flow. The name's not important. The key thing is the river water is less dense than the basin water. Um, and this is a way of, of building up mouth bars and also of um, allowing or, or transporting fine grain sediments away from the river mouth uh, and, and depositing on the outer part of the, the delta front. Okay, um, maybe one thing I should say here, these, these two conditions here, the river water being more dense than the basin water, the river water being less dense than the basin water, the same river can behave in those two different ways. When it's in flood, the water can be more dense. When it's out of flood, the water can be less dense. So uh, the same river can behave in different ways. Okay, other processes. Well, friction. Um, so when the, riv when the water exits the river mouth, uh, it's, it's flowing over, over a rough bed and that can cause the flow to decelerate. As the flow decelerates, the coarser fraction of the sediment is deposited. And that course of sediment is deposited as a mouth, sorry, as a bar at the mouth of the river. So bar at the mouth of the a river channel that we call that a mouth bar. In cases where um, maybe the, the water depth in the basin is a little bit deeper um, or the, the water in the river is a little bit less dense, uh, 
that sediment can be transported further from the river mouth. Um, there's a greater increase, a greater amount of buoyancy. And in that case, the, this mouth bar is less well defined and it, it, it's, it's a further distance seaward from the river mouth. So this, this, this frictional process is important because it's, this is how deltas grow or helps to explain how deltas grow. Maybe let me go back one slide to this, this top image here. So here we have river transporting sediments and water. The coarse sediment is deposited in front of the river mouth. Well, don't forget this, 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 river, this, this channel system, this delta is still building out from left to right on that image. So if we basically, we, if we, we dump this bar directly in front of the channel, the channel has to split around the mouth bar. Okay, we might then establish you know, two new channels we can have a bar deposited at the front of each of these. And again, the channel will then split into, you know, each channel will split into two components around the bar. So if we're purely thinking about deltas in which the processes at the river mouth are important, then we might expect to have lots of channels branching downstream. So we end up with lots and lots of these channels and we have lots and lots of these mouth bars um, deposited as the system builds outwards. And we can see that in, in modern examples that are well documented. So the images are here, these are line drawings drawn from satellite images um, over a period of about 10 years from 1973 to 1982. And these are line drawings of the Wax Lake Delta. So this is a small delta building out from the Mississippi River. Um, the scale in here, so um, where are we? This, this scale bar here is about two and a half kilometers. So these, each of these little maps in here is about um, probably a little bit more than 10 kilometers wide. So here's the river mouth initially, it's building out and we, de we, we have a sort of one clearly defined channel with, with mouth bars in, in black in here. You can already maybe see those hints of, of branching um, and splitting downstream of that river channel. Okay, in 1975, so just, just two years later, you can see there's a lot more black on here. A lot more mouth bars have been deposited, which, which are now um, the tops of those bars are above the lake level that this delta is building out into. At 76 and then 1979, again, you can see that just over a few years, we've deposited an awful lot of sediment within this complex arrangements of mouth bars and if we zoom into here we can see this pattern of you know one trunk channel splitting downstream into multiple smaller channels so that that's that downstream splitting process which I talked about earlier okay so river river mouth uh, river dominated deltas in the absence of waves or tides some way of moving the sediments away from the mouth bars, we have this downstream branching. Now, waves can rework that sediment. We've already seen that. Waves can take the sediment from the mouth bar and they can rework it along the shoreline. And that's pretty typical. In this example, the waves are approaching sort of straight on to the shoreline. And what happens there is the sediment gets transported to the bottom and to the top. The mouth bar doesn't build up to the same extent. The channel doesn't have to split around it. So the action of the waves moving the sediments away from the river mouth means that we don't, you know, we, we just keep to one channel. One variation on this, if we imagine um, the river, this is our river mouth feeding sediment to the shoreline. In this case, the white arrow in these, for each of these little maps, the white arrow is showing the river, the strength of the river current. The black arrow is showing currents parallel to the shoreline, which are formed by waves, and those waves are approaching the shoreline at an angle. So in, the, in this, this first diagram, or first pair of diagrams on the, the left, the, we have a big white arrow, the river mouth um, velocity is greater than the longshore velocity. And we have deltas which are symmetrical, okay? 
as we move towards the right, this, this, we basically have a larger black arrow, so stronger longshore currents, and the river mouth gets deflected, it gets pushed in the direction of those longshore currents. And we have an asymmetrical delta. And if we take that to an extreme, a much larger uh, longshore current compared to the river mouth current directed offshore, then that, that sense of asymmetry becomes more pronounced. And you can see here the river channel is deflected, so it's almost parallel to the shoreline. Okay, so we can, we can, we can get different, um, different morphologies, different geometries to these deltas, depending on the interplay between the river mouth processes and the wave processes. Tidal processes, well tides can also move sand away from the, the mouth of the river. So here's a schematic of a river feeding sediment into a delta um, and the delta in this case has uh, interaction with tides and tides are flowing onshore and then flowing offshore over a 12 hour or a 24 hour period. So tides tend to, to move the sand away from the river mouth and instead of transporting it along the shoreline, they tend to move it offshore and to generate these elongate bars or ridges or shoals. These are words that all essentially mean the same thing. And we have these sort of uh, isolated um, elongate bodies of sand. That means we're not blocking the mouth of the river with the mouth bar and therefore the river can stay in the same position. So again, tides act to prevent or, or suppress this downstream branching of the river channel. Okay, in terms of vertical succession, so we're thinking here about a, a river dominated delta, so one in which the action of waves or tides is, is minimal. Um, well, we have an upward coarsening succession. As we go from um, further away from the river mouth, we have more mud, and as we move closer and closer to the river mouth as the delta builds out, we see progressively more sand. But what, you, what you'll notice in here is there's an, there's a, an alternation between sand and mud. Um, we don't have waves, for example, to, to clean up the, the sediment and to, and to sort of strip off the fine grain sediment and move it offshore. Instead, that mud is accumulating uh, in between river floods and that the, the sand beds might record an influx of sand um, and transport of sand during a river flood. Sedimentary structures in here, well, that, that's shown schematically in this, this black and white um, sort of drawing of what we might see in core. We tend to see ripples, so asymmetrical ripples telling us of one current direction. And once we get into the shallowest part of the section, we might see um, trough or tabular cross beds and those those cross beds and the current ripples will tend to record flow in an offshore direction the mudstones in between there they, they can also be deposited rapidly but they're there um, and that they can have patchy bioturbation within them so this upward coarsening succession records a change in relatively deep conditions away from the river mouth to progressively shallower conditions close to the river mouth and then across this surface here that records a deepening a flooding back into these relatively deep water distal conditions far away from the river mouth so this would be an example of a fluvial dominated deltaic power sequence with a flooding surface on top Okay, so some, some pictures of, of modern deltas. Well, you know, the, the type example of a fluvial dominated delta is the modern Mississippi Delta. Here we have the Mississippi Delta. You can see, you know, one channel that's, that's partly been kept in that position through um, engineering, man-made engineering. But then you can see that, that channel branching downstream into multiple smaller channels. That's what we expect to see in river dominated deltas. And in this case, you can see lots of muddy sediment being carried in plumes out of those river mouths. Here we're looking at a succession and outcrop of, of a, a river dominated delta, much, much smaller than the Mississippi example, but we have an upward coarsening. So here we have 
predominantly mudstones in the distal part of the delta front or the pro delta and as we move upwards we see progressively more sand beds with this, this sort of hard resistant beds with the, with the orange color but you can see in here there's still mudstones finer grain mudstones deposited all the way through there in between these these packages of sandstone beds other things in here well this is this is the same uh, the same um, example of, a, of an ancient delta as I showed in the last photograph but here we're standing back and looking at a cliff face which is about 30 meters in height and about 100 meters from from left to right so we can see one two upward coursing successions in here so these are two para sequences with with a flooding surface in between if we look at the lower of those two para sequences we can see you know mudstones in the gray color at the base and as we move up we see interbedded sandstones and mudstones the thin mudstones are what give us these nice clear um, bedding surfaces within the cliff face and we're getting progressively more sand upwards if we trace out some of these bedding surfaces you can see they're dipping down towards the left and they're dipping down quite steeply by quite steeply i mean somewhere roughly about three to five degrees and that records the front of the delta that's that's steep it's steeper than we saw in shore faces and that's because we're we're basically dumping sediment at the mouth of the river channel and that is causing us to build up relatively steep topography the other thing you can see in here is this this orange feature here which is a sandstone and you can see that has a channelized geometry so this is an example of a channel feeding one of these, these delta lobes. One sort of slightly contradictory observation here though, is that channel, given that channel geometry, it must be feeding sediment and water into the cliff face away from you or out of the cliff face towards you. But then if we look at the dip of these beds, they're dipping down towards the left. So, what that means is the delta is dipping the delta front is dipping from right down towards the left but the channel is feeding at 90 degrees to that so that that maybe implies that that channel was not feeding that delta low but there's been a switch in the position of the delta we'll come back to that other things in here well here's an example of a there's, there's a, a large accumulation of sand in here overlying a thick accumulation of mud and there's a person for scale there this is this again is part of a delta a river dominated delta one effect of, of depositing lots of sediment in one place at the mouth of a river channel rather rapidly in a delta is we generate instability we put a lot of sediment on top of poorly compacted mudstone and that can generate faults growth faults for example so what you can see here this this you might need to take my word for this um, if you trace out the, the, the right hand edge of this body of sand you see it's very sharp and we can trace it out we have to trace it between patches of scree in here and loose ru loose rubbly rocks but you can see it defines a sharp surface and that's a growth fault if we look at beds in the sandstone they're they're, they're horizontal over here but then you see them steepening up and dipping down into the fault plane so horizontal and steepening up dipping down into the fault plane so that's telling us these beds these sandstone beds they're getting thicker uh, they're expanding in towards this fault plane that's characteristic of a growth fault and again that that's typical of river dominated deltas where they build out over poorly compacted muds in cores what might we see so here's a series of cores a series of beds from the delta front each one of those is has a has a sharp base medium sand and then a fine grain top which includes some um, in places some ripples here's the, the one below a, a sharp top so sharp base medium grain sand and you can maybe pick out ripple cross lamination in here at the top so these each one of these beds represents one of these 
um, dense flows uh, corresponding to a river flood. Um, and the, ch the vertical change from medium sand to fine sand is recording the waning of that flow as it decelerates. The middle picture here is showing these, these sort of dish structures. These are basically caused by water escape. Sand deposited rather rapidly on top of poorly consolidated sediment. The water in the, in the underlying sediment has to get out somehow and it forces way up, its way upwards. As that water moves upwards, it, it sort of bends the edges of, of the lamination, including maybe some thin, silty laminations in here. And that gives us this type of geometry. And then this last image on the right is basically looking at the top of the delta. And we see a root trace running down through there, a couple of cross sections of root traces. Those are telling us that the top of that succession is, is exposed and we have roots going there. Okay, so I, just to finish off here, I, I, I mentioned this idea about lobe switching. So here we've got a picture of the, of the Mississippi Delta, um, the modern Mississippi Delta. What we see today is, is largely been engineered over the last century or so. Um, but when when the first um, European Europeans arrived in this area, they they noted that the delta lobes switched through time. So what you can see in here, you know, the, the modern delta lobes in here, but you also see these these sort of teardrop shaped features with dates next to them. So the idea was that, say, the delta built out, it, it, it built out to this, this position here. Then in 1839, it switched its position to, to here, built out a new lobe here. That lobe was then abandoned, and, and 14 years later, we build out a new lobe here. 17 years later, we build out a new lobe in here. So why does that happen? Well, as the delta builds out, you can see we build out these long um, channels those channels are transporting sediment and water a long distance downstream. They're also depositing vertically. They're depositing on the bed of the river. So what that means is the river itself becomes sort of raised up above the level of the delta top. So long channels, which are geographically or topographically raised above the delta plain, that's not very stable. Uh, and when the river floods, it, it, it's 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 energetically it's um it's easier to to sort of switch to a shorter position which is lower down topographically that saves potential energy and that's what drives this lobe switching process um and you can see in the mississippi delta that took place every every one to three decades historically before we artificially engineered the delta and that can explain, for example, how we might have a delta low building out in one direction and a channel cutting across it at 90 degrees to the delta lobe, as we sort of inferred from one of the earlier photographs I showed you. OK, so fluvial processes, we tend to, in a fluvial dominated delta to have lots of downstream branching channels, distributary channels. Um, that gives us this, this sort of rather finger-like protrusion of, of delta lobes, provided we don't rework that, that sediment by waves or tides. Vertical successions course and upwards, but at a bed scale, there's lots of alternation between sand and mud, and that records rapid variations in, in sediment flux, the flow velocity, you know, whether the river is in flood, whether it's out of flood. That can also give rise to changes in salinity, which are reflected, for example, in trace fossils, burrows within the succession. And we also have this lobe switching. Okay, so that lobe switching is, is a process which is inherent to the delta. It's not caused by a change in sea level. It's not caused by a change in sediment supply. It's just inherent within the delta that this instability is there. Once we exceed a certain threshold, in that instability, the delta switches to a new position. And we use this term autogenic to refer to those processes which are inherent to the system. This is a cross section from left to right um, through a, a delta X succession, which is about 200 meters in thickness. The horizontal scale here is about, um, about 60 or 70 kilometers.
The green in here is the delta plane, and this has coals in. It also has lots of channels in, in the red in here. The yellow are basically delta load deposits. So what you can see in here, if we look at you know 1Z, 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D, 1E, everything with a 1 in front records the building out of a delta, more or less at the same position. But as we go from A to B to C to D, that's recording this switching of the delta lobes as the delta system as a whole is building out. So what that means is river dominated deltas, we have quite complex stratigraphic architectures. We build out difficult reservoirs to produce from because these lobes are quite small. They have a quite a complex relationship to each other in terms of their stacking, difficult to predict given the kinds of data we typically work with in the subsurface. Just the last slide in here, just to emphasize that, you know, I've talked so far about N members, waves, wave dominated shorelines, river dominated deltas, but many deltas have a mix of, of wave, tidal and river mouth processes. And one good example is the modern, is the Niger Delta. So here, for example, here we have the, the, the river, Niger River in, in, in yellow, sorry, in, in orange. The shoreline is affected by waves. So in yellow, we have these straight sections of the shoreline in between channels. Some of those channels are, are river generated in orange and some of them are tidal in brown. So just to make the point that deltas, as with any other shallow marine system, exhibit more than one process. Okay, so that's the point at which I want to stop.